There are people that will tell you that a banana duct taped to a wall has as much artistic or intrinsic beauty and value as the paintings in the Hagia Sophia or the Sistine Chapel. And these people, often called uh, postmodernists, are morons. Because art, and drama in particular, which is what I'm going to focus on heavily in this video, is a deeply biological and evolved phenomenon, one that first took the form of ritual in our prehistoric past, and now most often manifests itself in film and movies, and it is important to understand that these films and movies can offer the viewer objective psychological value. And of course, art has a subjective element, just like food does, and, you know, some people like spicy food, some people don't, everyone has different tastes, but the nutritional value you get from food is an objective phenomenon. And that kind of thinking is helpful in understanding the value of art and drama in particular. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. So by the end of this video, you will not only walk away with a practical understanding of why you are so profoundly affected by the movies you personally find deeply compelling, but you will begin to notice the experience of being deeply immersed in a movie and increase the probability that you can actually learn something from that experience. I'm going to show you a variety of clips from different movies and TV shows, along with extracts from Professor Jordan Peterson's Personality and its Transformations course taught at the University of Toronto. But we'll start with one of my all-time favorite moments in TV history when Will Smith reacts to his dad walking out of his life the second time in the TV show The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I'm sorry, Will. <laughs> you know what, actually, this works out better for me. You know, the Slimmies of Summer come to class wearing next to nothing, you know what I'm Will, saying? Will, it's all right to be angry. Hey, well, why should I be mad? I'm saying at least he said goodbye this time. I just wish I hadn't wasted my money buying this stupid present. I'm sorry. I, you know, if there was something that I Hey, could you know do. what? You ain't got to do no, nothing, Uncle Phil. Hey, you know, ain't like I'm still five years old, you know? Ain't like I'm going to be sitting up every night asking my mom, when's daddy coming home, you know? Who needs him? Hey, he wasn't there to teach me how to shoot my first basket, but I learned, didn't I? Hey, I got pretty damn good at it, too, didn't I, yeah, Uncle Phil? Did. Got through my first date without him, right? Mm -hmm. I learned how to drive. I learned how to shave. I learned how to fight without him. I had 14 great birthdays without him. He never even sent me a damn card. The hell with him! I ain't need him then, and I don't need him now. Will. Will. Now, you know what, Uncle Phil? I'm going to get through college without him. I'm going to get a great job without him. I'm going to marry me a beautiful honey, and I'm having me a whole bunch of kids. I'm going to be a better father than he ever was. And I sure as hell don't need him for that, because ain't a damn thing he could ever teach me about how to love my kids. How come he don't want me, man? There is a reason that this scene, and any piece of fiction that you personally find compelling, invokes this feeling. On the one hand, it may seem self-evident, we are human beings capable of empathy, and Will was in pain, and so we feel empathy for Will, and therefore that's why we feel the emotion. But this poses a problem because Will is not a real character. In fact, he's a series of pixels on a screen in a fictional setting that I have basically cut and pasted and edited and I'm showing to you now, and yet the emotion you might feel is still very real. And if you go your whole life without noticing these kinds of things, then you are letting psychologically valuable information slip through your fingers. So here's where I want to introduce a crucially important concept known as the archetypes. For the purposes of this video, we can define an archetype as a universal pattern pattern of behavior, one that precedes any cultural or social conditioning. For example, getting angry, or dreaming, or falling in love. These are all experiences and behaviors that almost all human beings will experience over the course of their life, regardless of what culture you are in. You can think of these archetypes as biological phenomena. So one of my favorite examples is there's a video of a bunch of sea turtles that when they hatch, they immediately make their way to the ocean. The moment they are born, they are pre-wired with a propensity to engage in a certain behavior. And since it's inbuilt to the turtles and universal to all of them, we can call that behavior archetypes. Tipple. And human beings are the same way. It's a lot more complicated, and those behaviors and the representations of those behaviors are very complicated, but they are real nonetheless. And it's important to understand this concept in relationship to film and drama, because good fiction 
is only good or only compelling insofar as it represents these archetypal behaviors. What good fiction does is it distills the human experience down to its fundamental and universally experienced elements, love, success, failure, death, loneliness, all of these things, and it represents them in a relatable context, a context that draws upon your personal and unique lived experiences. Here's Jordan Peterson to explain. You're going to be manifesting archetypal patterns of behavior in your life, whether you know it or not. Um, even when you do something like fall in love, because that's going to be a very particular experience for you, but it's also a very common experience at the same time, right? And, and romance is older than people. That's one way of looking, about, looking at it. I mean, because sex is older than human beings. And so you're in the grip of something that's really ancient, but at the same time, it's really personal. And so a good novelist or a writer of fiction is able to capture both the personal element of that to show, show the transpersonal within the personal. So in other words, a good work of fiction will be meaningful to you, the viewer, because it offers personal psychological insight through a impersonal representation. And these impersonal representations draw upon the archetypes in order to convey meaning, right? Your father did not need to abandon you in order for you to empathize with Will Smith and understand his emotion and his pain because the feeling of abandonment and isolation and loneliness are universal experiences. They're the transpersonal experiences that we can relate to through our personal experiences. So if an archetypal behavior is a pattern of behavior that is universally experienced, an archetypal representation is an image or a symbol or a character that embodies and represents that behavior. Anger is an archetypal pattern of behavior and it is represented in many different contexts. You can think about the Roman god Mars, who is the god of rage, or you can think about the Disney movie Inside Out, the little anger guy, who is about as pure of an archetypal representation as you can encounter. So there are archetypal patterns of behaviors and then archetypal representations of those behaviors. And they're both often referred to as archetypes. But once you understand this, you'll begin to see these archetypes pop up in every piece of fiction you watch. Yeah, well, there's not much difference between Gandalf and uh, who's the wizard in Harry Potter. Dumbledore, they could be the same guy, it's right, right. And so, while that, that is precisely the indication of the existence of an archetype, it's like, and a movie, one time a student asked me, well, if, if there are these archetypes, why don't we just tell the archetype over and over? Why do we need fiction, for example, which is like a bridge, if there's individuals here and the archetype is up here, you know, at a high level of abstraction, fiction sort of fills the gap between them. And so what you want is a a story that's archetypal so that you understand its basic structure, but you want enough variation and specificity so that it's new and interesting and also applicable to you. So you have to humanize the archetype to some degree, otherwise it's so abstract you can't, you can't relate to it. And, and good stories really do that, they bridge the gap, and some of them are more personal and less archetypal, but if they're completely non-archetypal, there's nothing about them that captures you, it doesn't have any force. And then if it's too archetypal, well, it gets to be too abstract and you can't relate to it. So good fiction writers and, and good purveyors of, of dramatic entertainment, we think about it as entertainment, are really good at occupying that middle position. And like I said at the beginning, there is a subjective element to art, so that middle position is actually a spectrum. And you can have movies like Lord of the Rings, which are very archetypal, battle of good and evil, wizards versus demons. <laughs> Then you can have a movie like Marriage Story, which is much more personal and humanized, although still drawing on archetypal ideas. And in between, you might have a movie like Silence of the Lambs, which deals with the most extreme dramatized versions of human evil while still in a real world context, so to speak. A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. So now that you have an image of a cannibalistic serial killer in your mind, let's analyze this scene from my favorite TV show of all time, Friends. And if you have a problem with that, then you can fucking leave. All you need to know in this scene is that Rachel is in love with Ross, and Ross is annoying Rachel because he's talking to his girlfriend on the phone. Oh, that is so sweet. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, okay. No, you hang up. No, you, okay. Okay. One, two, three. Well, you didn't hang up either. She didn't hang up. <laughs> oh, 
look at no, no, you hang up, you, you, you. So what exactly is going on in this scene? You have the archetypes of love and jealousy, and in this scene, those archetypes are grounded in a very modern and relatable context, and then those archetypes are distilled and dramatized into the scene you just saw. Right, if anyone did this like in real life and was actually that close with the phone, you'd think they're a psychopath, but it's a representation, it's a dramatic representation of exactly the kind of annoyance you might feel if someone you're attracted to is you know, talking about the person that they're attracted to and you're not it. Now this last part of the video is the most important because before these ideas can become permanently ingrained in your head, you have to understand sort of the biological and evolutionary background on why these ideas manifest themselves the way that they do. As I mentioned earlier, drama is an evolved phenomenon and the cognitive processes associated with it are the same ones involved in social learning, which is the capacity for humans and some mammals to learn through observation and imitation. Let's look at a very useful passage from Jordan Peterson's new book, Beyond Order. It is easier and more direct to represent a behavioral pattern with behavior than with words. Outright mimicry does that directly, action for action. So a good example of this is uh, there's a video of an orangutan wringing out a towel um, after having watched the zookeepers do it. This is the process of mimicry, or one-for-one -one action mapping, and it's so deep in our evolutionary past that orangutans can do it. Then we have imitation, which can produce new behaviors akin to those that motivated the mimicry, which takes that one step further. And we've all seen imitation in the form of impersonators before. They're not necessarily doing one-for-one one action mapping, but they are capturing the spirit of those individual actions and then extracting what is common amongst all of those and then being able to generate something new. So here's one of my favorite examples of imitation from TikTok. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. I can sit next to check. I'm good. Scooch. Scooch a boot. Scooch a What is this about? Mmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I absolutely love TikTok and I will be making extensive use of it in future videos, just heads up. But after imitation, we have drama, which is formalized imitation enacted upon a stage and is precisely behavior portraying behavior but distilled ever closer to the essence. This last extract from Jordan Peterson's lectures, I think really puts all of this into an understandable context. You know, if you look at the same thing that someone else is looking at, you're imitating them. And one of the things that's interesting is that if you're looking at the same thing that someone else is looking at, and you inhabit the same value structure, then your emotional responses are going to be very much akin to one another. And you can tell that when you go to a movie and you watch the hero and you embody the hero while you're doing so, and the emotions that you produce inside of you by imitating the hero on the screen enable you to figure out what the hero is going through, and you can learn from that. And so that's a very complex form of imitation, and we do that when we tell stories or we watch stories. And those stories are really complicated because, as we already outlined, they're not just factual representations of someone's action during a day. They're representations of the important things that the person did, the meaningful things. And so when you go see a movie, all you're doing is watching meaningful things, if the movie's any good. And you know that because, well, if the movie isn't meaningful, well, then you leave. You're bored, right? It's, and it, the fact that it's meaningful is what keeps you in the seat. And you don't necessarily know why. In fact, you often have no idea why it's meaningful. It's like watching Pinocchio rescue his father from a whale it's like what the hell you know how why is that meaningful well you don't know but it is well now you know why it's meaningful and now you can walk away with a deeper appreciation of film and understand that when you are feeling emotional when you're watching a character that you resonate with go through something you may be able to ask yourself why am i responding to this character in such a way what emotions is it evoking what archetypes is it hitting and what is the hero doing to overcome his or her struggle that i can learn from and maybe apply in my own life and so with that good luck and godspeed actually I do want to say thank you for everyone who has followed this channel up so far. I do have some new equipment. I do have a bunch of new video ideas. I plan on getting these out um, more rapidly or more regularly. Um, but if you enjoyed it, please let me know. It's very encouraging when people I don't know say, hey, this really helped or it was really useful and it makes me want to do it more. So with that, good luck and Godspeed. <laughs>